I'm Nicola Robinson, Commissioning Editor at Harlequin, a division of HarperCollins. Today, I'm lucky enough to be chatting with the fabulous Marianne O'Connor about her new book, Where Fortune Lies. Hi, Marianne. Hello. <laughs> How about we start with you telling us about Where Fortune Lies, what the story is? Well, Where Fortune Lies is the story of Anne Brown, who's a poor Irish girl who, through a set of unfortunate circumstances, and then fortunate circumstances, <laughs> ends up in Australia in 1879, and she ends up an exotic dancer called Christelle Amore. And Anne's story actually is entwined with Will and Mari Worthington and their best friend, Charlie, and they end up following her out here. And all four of them end up entwined with a family whose sons are bushrangers. So you do end up in the high country, you end up in the wild frontier of Australia's wild west, I suppose you'd call it, and galloping along with um, the brumbies and the horses through the high country. And it's, it's, it's a really rollicking tale, I like to think. And I like to think that when you're reading it, you're really turning the page to the end to see what happens um, and how their fortunes turn out. Because in the end, the moral of the story really is you make your own fortune and it's your choices that will dictate your fate. Hey, sounds awesome. Our HQ Fiction History campaign this year is focused on strong and rebellious women. Of course, there are many of those in Australia's history, but in creating the character of Christelle, you've drawn on the story of an extraordinary woman who spent time in the Australian gold fields. Can you tell us about her? Yes, that's actually um, Lola Montez, who was originally Marie Gilbert, who was also just an ordinary Irish girl who led an extraordinary life. She completely reinvented herself and she ended up being a courtesan, the mistress to a king, a political activist and an exotic dancer in Australia. Um, she also very famously horsewhipped a journalist down the main street of Melbourne. <laughs> uh, but she ended up, her last days were actually working with women on the streets and a refuge in New York, which is you know, really quite advanced for the times. And she died of syphilis at the age of 39 over there. But I like to think she lived a really extraordinary life. And people might say it's a tragic life. I think she lived an adventure. And I also think she made the most of um, the rights women had, so few. She just defied those odds and she lived life on her own terms. And she made it what she wanted it to be in the best way she could. I have a great deal of admiration for her courage, but also for just for her passion that she wanted to really, really live. And uh, she was a wonderful muse for me, for my character of Anne Brown. I think that comes through in the story as well. You've drawn on other real events to create Where Fortune Lies. One of my favourite stems from a story your father, the artist Kevin Best, used to tell about musicians camping in the Australian Highlands one night. Can you tell us about that? Yes, that's my great-grandfather. I'm pretty sure it's my great-grandfather. It might be great-great. Anyway, it's a true story. It's been handed down through my family. He was in a brass band and they used to travel through remote parts of New South Wales. This was actually out the back of Tenterfield, um, in fact, and they used to travel overnight and camp in the bush. And the bush Anyone who's ever spent the night in the Australian bush knows that there's some very mysterious noises that can occur and it can be quite um, a frightening place or a mysterious place. And this particular night, they were sitting there around the campfire and these mounted men came through heavily armed and they melted through into the firelight and it was Captain Thunderbolt and his cronies, the, the famous bush ranger, and he said... Pardon me, gentlemen, but can I trouble you for a concert? And so they play this impromptu concert, I imagine very shakily, in the middle of the bush. And at the conclusion, he said, thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. And off he went again. <laughs> and it's an incredible story. I had to include it um, because it's a true story. And uh, he certainly lived up to his name, uh, the gentleman bush ranger. <laughs> Absolutely. I always feel like I learn so much about the past when I read your novels. So I'd like to ask about your research process. How do you go about what must be a huge task? Well, fortunately with this one, I had researched the Eureka Stockade. Um, and so I, 
in the previous book. So I was able to take a lot of that research and apply it to the next generation because it's only like 25 years later or so. So using all of that previous research really came in handy. Um, so that was one thing. I understood the era, I suppose you'd say. The next thing I did was I just sort of looked at, well, what extraordinary events were happening in Australia during, you know, 1879, 1880. And of course, it was um, it was the, the capture of the Kelly gang and it was the end of the bush ranging phase. So that became a very obvious part of the storyline and really took off, actually. I really enjoyed writing about the bush rangers and their reasons, their political reasons, was really fascinating. But I tend to find my greatest resources are always real life stories. So I'll do a lot of Googling, a lot of researching, a lot of reading, but it's definitely the real life stories that um, inspire me the most and help me to draw upon characters that feel authentic. That sounds like a fantastic immersive experience. Do you also travel to the places that are depicted in your books? Yes, the high country is really sacred in my family. My father, Kevin Best, as you mentioned, um, loved to paint the high country and he was very well known for it. He painted these beautiful paintings and I was just as in love with the countryside as he was and I used to write poetry about it and do sketching and so on but he was uh, of course the master. I always dreamed that one day I would try to emulate in words what he uh, managed to capture in oil paint and so finally now at this age I'm doing that which is wonderful it's a wonderful privilege. The Australian Alps are very different to any other Alps in the world they're prehistoric really they're very ancient they're being weathered down by time and they're incredibly beautiful in their own unique way. So um, the animals are unique and the people are unique. Mm -hmm. the, the whole vistas are unique because you know that it's taken, you know, millions of years for them to form. Um, they're very beautiful to me. And I've been fortunate enough to spend quite a bit of time there watching Brumbies get broken in and so on. Seeing the wild horses is another great privilege. It, it, just the snow gums. The snow gums look like somebody's painted them and, and the paint's dripping off them. There's, there's such works of art in themselves. So it's one of my favourite places in the whole world and it was just wonderful to write about it. You also write about um, an area of County Donegal in Ireland in the book. Is that a place you've been to? And if not, how did you recreate it? Because it's so convincing. <laughs> I haven't been there, <laughs> but I have been to Ireland. Um, it's something like that, for example. You just really want to get that right. And if you haven't been fortunate enough to be there, even though I've been close, what I do is I'll put on Irish music and I will put on image after image after image. I'll just go through Google Images and I will just look again and again at that place, every angle of it every aspect of it and I'll immerse myself in that place until I feel like I've been there and then I will read everything I can about it um, especially because this was about the Beltane. I, I really wanted to know a lot about the Beltane and I read a lot of non-fiction about the places all the times not fiction because I will tend to copy that author um, not meaning to I just, I'm a bit of a parrot so I never read fiction when I'm writing, actually, because I, especially if it's the same era, because I will start sort of sounding like that author. So um, yes, lots of lots of research, both in books and googling and so on. But to immerse myself in that place, it's really the imagery, and I tend to really use the music, so it's like a sensory experience. You just mentioned you just mentioned the Beltane. I um I was amazed by your depiction of these sexual pagan rituals so late in the 19th century. Um, is that really what happened? Well, who knows, it could still be happening now, Nicola. Yeah. But, so <laughs> it's actually really interesting. Um, I, I had researched this in the past. The, um, the Beltane is a really sacred pagan festival and when Ireland was taken over by Christianity, they were it was a very different kind of religion. So they, they had to pretty much give away the old ways most of the year. So this is the one night when they don't and they revert back to the pagan past. And with that comes some pretty risque stuff, you know, beyond the, the Beltane fires. And, uh, yeah, I, I was pretty intrigued by it myself when I got down to the details of what went on, especially with the horned mask and the antlers and the mysterious... Um, man that you could be with so it's it's in, it's incredibly sort of you know 
erotic and sensual, but it's also very dangerous as you find out. Thanks so much, Marianne. And of course, Marianne's new novel, Where Fortune Lies, is available online and at all physical bookstores.